Thank you again for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Serena. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us. Chris, uh, Chris and I have known each other for a long time, quite some time, about 25 years, I'd yep. say. Yep. <laughs> so although we didn't collaborate in a traditional sense, if it wasn't for Chris, I wouldn't have been able to finish my book because uh, I would have had to write it in my house. <laughs> I'd still be writing it now. <laughs> um, so as, Ser as Serena said, Chris has worked for a lot of uh, you know, major, major filmmakers. Jim Jarmusch, I don't think you mentioned. I didn't. didn't I did yeah. not know that. Todd Salons, uh, you know, everybody. I can't think. I had There's them. five. Yeah. <laughs> Mar Martin Scorsese. She, she, she worked on The Wolf, Wa Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, but, you know, in addition to that, you, 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 did, you didn't start out to go into uh, movie, movie production art departments, right? You, you, didn't, it wasn't, you didn't start out to be a set decorator or production designer Correct. or uh, art director. Right. <coughs> you started out, you know, as a traditional artist in, in things that weren't really related to the cinema. In fact, things that were more, you know, abstract than one usually associates with narrative feature films. Correct. So, you know, what, what, how, what did you start out doing exactly? Um, I, started out, I started out painting. I studied painting. Well, I, when I left high school, I was studying graphic design for a couple of years, and then I moved in a small town in Pennsylvania. And so I thought um, I would move to the big city of Boston, and I studied painting there. And, um, but I got into that school through um, the graphic design program. But I wanted to be a painter, but they were, it was, um, the process of, of switching departments was kind of difficult. Um, but I did manage to do that, and I managed to, I was studying with a man, his name is Robert Moore, and he's a colorist. And he was like the big shot. And somehow I managed to slip into that class. Although, once I slipped in, I avoided him as long as I could because I was terrified. Well, what do and you mean he was a colorist? What does that mean exactly? He was Can a you? formal colorist. So his paintings, and he came from, he, his paintings were color block. He was a, a student of Joseph Albers. And so he was just very formal, um, very, you know, breaking everything down to like all of your grays and lines and understanding everything step by step. And so um, when he finally, finally caught me, his, um, what I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, he knew that. And then he told me, um, well, why don't you draw this chair? Let's just start out there. We'll just draw this chair. And I said, okay. He said, I'll be back Wednesday. Draw the chair 50 times and hang them up in the hallway. And then you tell me three chairs that you like, three drawings of chairs that you like and why. So um, I did that. And then, um, and he said, and just use just black and white. Just do a line drawing of the chair. So I did that. And then um, I continued to draw that chair for a or, for about four years, and um, <laughs> and it was a fantastic journey of just discovering line and trying to place it in space and using just the monochromatic scale. And I, I don't know, it was a, it was a great great journey. And I think that um, I never I never used I never wound up using color in my entire college career. Well, you mentioned that he you know taught you everything monochromatically. Well, yeah, you described him as a colorist. So, you know, he never <clears throat> brought you up to what he was actually doing the entire time you were there? No. Not he, at all. Um, I think that he saw that I was discovering sort of new things every day. And he, you know, he probably thought that there was plenty to learn within that. Um, and there was. And like just that journey and just the decision making that's involved in painting and working on a within a rectangle, and, um, and I, I've, I've found it very fascinating, too. Well, so what did you, when you finished school, when you finished drawing all these chairs in black and white and gray yeah. <laughs> for four years, what did, you, what did you then do when you were Well, were I guess I should that? mention that I, when I was drawing the chairs, I started out, you know, on, the, on a newsprint pad, on a large-scale newsprint pad, and then in the end I was drawing chairs, and they were... Um, seven feet by ten feet and it was just like sort of they became just like line drawings 
and they were chairs like similar to these, you know, and it was, it was very actually, it was this chair. This is, this is, this is an Ames chair, I believe. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. It, it was like the potato chip, it was the potato chip shape of the chair and then the lines and, and then, you know, making, making that flip flop in space and understanding why oh. that was happening and then, and then just under, trying to control the spatial, you know, the depth and spatial and visual experiences, you know, with and them. And so, you know, I remember your work, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I met you some years after this, a few years after that. Yeah. And, you know, your work was very, very large and, and, and also abstract then. It was, it was, you know, kind of monumental, really, mural size, uh, abstract line drawings on, I don't know what you call that kind of like oh craft paper i think when i met when i first met you i was i was wilding the drawings yes yeah? you, were, you were you were putting them up in public yeah you know wheat pasting them in public spaces uh around town right and um you know can why don't i you had tell um, something about uh, that? we inherited a uh, my boyfriend and i inherited a a 92 cadillac and so I would make these very large drawings on um, craft paper. And it's funny, uh, you say that they're, and I guess they are abstract, but it's, I never really, it's like if you're not, it doesn't feel like they're abstract if you're not abstracting something. You know, it just felt like they were line drawings. But I mean, I guess there's not a subject matter. I don't know, so I guess Well, the lines are. themselves are the subject matter. Yeah, I exactly. I mean, yeah. there's not, there was no green grass and horizon lines and stuff. But I mean, it just never occurred to me that they were abstract. And I never actually referred to them as being abstract. But I guess, you know, that's. Well, they didn't represent any exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. objects right. in reality that is or true. That is true. human figures or anything like no, that. No, that's right. They weren't representational. Right. So that, yeah, but they, they, were very, they were very big. Right. They were quite large, you know. Right. And um, how did you decide where you would put them? Um, I guess outside I just would see the large areas and I had a friend who wilded posters um, as a job and um, advertising advertising so that's like putting all the movie posters on the construction sites and um, and I would help him do that sometimes and um, so I learned that process and then I thought like I wasn't really attached to the gallery scene or anything like that and I was doing these very large drawings and then rolling them up and um, so I thought, oh, well, this I'm just going to do this. This is great. I can make these, put these giant drawings outside, and then I can, I don't know, that would be fun. So, um, and then that's what I wound up doing. Um, and so it was just craft paper, and they would just be panels like that. And sometimes they would be, you know, like nine feet or whatever by 14 feet, or I could, and then I would make the panels, and sometimes would like could switch them around and. And I put my name at the bottom, and I thought somebody was going to call. But, <laughs> but the, I, mean, I mean, lots of people saw them because people would talk about them sometimes. But they were set uh, uh, amidst other kinds of graffiti that right. was just there already. Right. So they right. were they were very different from what people associate with that kind of you know street art. Right. That's true. I mean, they didn't true. really look anything like anything else. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. That's true. I mean. I guess the you know they weren't right because they were they happened in a studio and they were thought out right. in, indoors. I mean, there's some people that wheat pasted things too, but they that they draw they had drawn somewhere else, but they tended to be more you know pe human figures and things. Well, I think you it's know? because I, I created a field, right? Yeah. Which that's what's different from not from gra most graffiti pieces, I think um, at the time. And so these these large pieces that are on these kind of blank backgrounds are kind of like you know, a, a movie screen, in a way. I mean, they're, right. they're large and they're designed to be seen by a lot of, you know, by more than one person at a time. Right. In, in you know, kind of monumental scale, uh, which, you know, like a 40-foot movie screen, is, you know, you're supposed to see movies in this, in this kind of, you're supposed to see large-scale projection <laughs> when you see a movie. Yeah. Not watch it on your phone. Right. And especially then, the idea of watching it on your phone wasn't Correct. really, didn't really exist yet in, 19, in the mid-90s. So do you, do you feel that there was a connection between going into films from doing this at all? I mean, what started you doing stuff for art departments of movies? Luck. Luck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, my, I was working, I was, um, there was a professor 
um, who needed somebody to sit in his gallery one summer and, um, in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And his cook's brother was a prop master in Boston. And so then he hired me one day to um, shop for him. And uh, that was on The Good Son, I think. Right? The Good Son? I don't know. But what do you mean? The his, Macaulay Culkin. His cook's, his cook's brother was a prop master? He had a cook? He had a and cook. And cook's brother was a prop master in yes, Boston. Yes, correct. So he's a prop guy in Boston. A prop guy in Boston. Who is that? Um, Dave Kulik. Oh, really? Yeah. Dave Kulik has Dave a brother Kulik's, who's a cook? No, Dave Kulik's. His <laughs> sister was a cook. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this doesn't matter who this person is. Yeah, anyway, so then they, he <laughs> He's a great hired, guy. Yeah, he <laughs> hired me, and then, uh, so I started, and he was like, well, here's $400, and here is a list of things that we need. So we need pillows and pots and pans and this. And I said, okay, got it, $400, that's a lot of money. Okay, got it. So then I went straight to the Salvation Army, and I got the pillows and the pots and pans, and I brought them back. But anyway, they, he, that was the beginning of my film. I started but, working so with you, him. So the first, the first film you worked on was, was a Hollywood movie. It was, With yes. a star in it, right. you know, kind of a big budget film. Right. You didn't start working on student films or you That's know, low correct. budget uh, in, in the financed right. movies that were local or anything like That's that. That's correct. Yeah. And I think like the connection that maybe, you know, one connection there is that because I wound up doing very large scale drawings, I, I kind of, I kind of had a physical confidence in drawing in that scale, and I think it, um, I kind of, I think that that actually le leans to some of the work that I do now, or like um, in events and sort of stage design kind of things, um, where scale to me, I, I'm just, I have no fear of scale. And I can, I just feel like that is a great bonus uh -huh. that I took out of. Draw, wind, winding up drawing. Right. So in addition to doing things on movie sets and for movie sets, you also do this in theater, uh, uh, other kinds of environmental spaces, into commercial space interiors and so on. Yeah. Oh. And also when I, I did a series for Red Bull for two years, I designed their, um, their music program. They do, um, they did, in one month, they did like 14 you know, shows, oh, which yeah. included like Solange at the Met and other, you know, and then like some South American band and in Giants Bay. I don't know. It was fun. It was kind of great because they were just right. like so as big as you can. Red Bull has something called Red Bull Music Academy. And Correct. in the summertime, they put on these large outdoor music shows. But they're, they're not, not outdoor. They're not always outdoor. No, they're never, yeah. they're rarely outdoor in uh. this, the New York Festival. But uh. yeah. And the, so the one was for Solange Knowles and it was in the Guggenheim. Right. Right. And it was this giant kind of empty white space. Yeah. And what did you do with that? Um, I would, uh, you know, the, the idea with the Red Bull Music Festival was that they wanted to provide to artists who maybe didn't have the opportunity to have like their dream show and their dream set, um, just to kind of allow, you know, provide them a, a resource to have do whatever they wanted. So I worked with actually each artist and. Um, we kind of came up with a concept together. And so with Solange, we did that as well. So we, we would just meet and have, we would meet and talk about what it kind of would be. And then we would do these um, renderings and we would go through versions of the renderings um, of, you know, we, we measure out the space and figure out like what she's thinking and then like try to bring those shapes and um, include the functionality and the amount of people that are in the band and her choreography. She actually made me go to all of her choreography too, so I had a full comprehension of what needed to happen. And, wh and what was it that she wanted uh, there to be in the Guggenheim? And also, why was she doing it the Guggenheim? Just because Red Bull wanted her to do it there? Was it her? No, idea it was her. It's, it was her choice to do it there. And I think that. Uh, I mean, I don't fully comprehend it, but I think she wanted to make use of the institutions and make use of them and bring bring the public into them in some there was some fold like that instead of them being solely elitist places she thought that she went I deserve like I deserve to be here we all deserve to be here like let's go here and do this and so in, in that one everyone was in white kind of yeah if I recall right and the, mm -hmm. and the set was white and everything right. was white and it had this kind of spiritual element, I guess. It did, a pure, it was sort of a purest thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't actually remember all the details of like her thinking in that. Um, I'll, I just got through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she seemed to be imitating Alice Coltrane some, somehow, a little bit. 
like uh, the the ashram period in her. her we actually life. did an Alice Coltrane show. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. That, where we was did. that? That was um, at the Knockdown Center. Where is that? In it's um, in Bushwick or Mass Beth, yeah, just outside. Yeah, we did a giant show there, which. And what did you do for that one? That's when that that's when Alice Coltrane's spiritual music was put out on CD finally. Yeah. Yeah. And what what did you do for that? Um, for that, we sort of we brought in the carpet from her own her own space um, in California. She has a small ashram there, so we we kind it's of for sale, by the way. Is it? If anyone wants to buy Alice Coltrane's ashram, <laughs> you can buy it for like thirty-five million dollars. Yeah. Um, we I did a large string um, a large string installation in the center of that space. That was just sort of like an infolding. It was like sort of like a flower, an organic sort of shape that I felt like centered this giant giant room. And then we <clears throat> put translucent panels of color. Um, on all the windows, um, large panels, and then we, what else did we do? What did we do with those flowers? Maddie was there. Maddie works with me. Well, so what did we do with the, fl with the flowers? We did, anyway, we hung all of these, um, um, the marigolds. We brought the marigolds in there. Those went. So I mean, we, we had in India these little cushions, so everybody sat, 300 people sat on 300 gold cushions that were made in India. The Laraji uh, one you did too was kind of like this. It was all white. It was very abstract. Everyone was just kind of lying around. Oh, and right. There was hammocks and string yeah, everywhere. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. For that, we, we built a 70-foot um, a two-tiered sofa that was in the shape of a cloud. That was sort of meant to sort of feel like a cloud. And it was an, a 10-hour ambient music festival. And <laughs> that was on a Sunday. <laughs> and then we also had like fabric hanging so people could go into these little pods and kind of just relax and listen to music. And then we made a swing set on the roof outside that was sort of an absurdist swing set that was like a, made a scribble kind of on a napkin and then made that the upper, you know, the, the top rung of the swing set. So and then we put proper commercial swings it was all made like a proper commercial swing set, and then, but if you actually tried to swing on it, you would just, everybody would just bump into each other. <laughs> so, uh, but it was sort of like just fun, taking some, just a twist. <laughs> so a lot of these, a lot of these spaces that you're, that you designed recently for music artists and so on and festivals, it, it's, it seems much more abstract and, um, for lack of a better word, and you know, not not rooted to any kind of normal furniture and things that one would see in a room. But when you work in films, of course, you are creating a set that's supposed to be an environment that looks lived in by people, for, for the most part. Right. And uh, that seems like the opposite of this, like completely different. So, so how, how does one thing that you do inform the other? That's such a good question, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had a good answer for it. The car on the way, <laughs> on the way here. <laughs> Maybe you've forgotten it. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> no, no I, no, I got this. I got this. Okay. Um, let me see. How, does the, how do they inform each other? Well, well, well we were talking about how... Um, a lot of movie sets, right. a lot of a lot of a lot of art direction in film, mm -hmm. and, and set 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 decoration and props and so on, yeah. doesn't really seem cinematic. It seems today, it seems more kind of like something that would be in a TV commercial. It just right. seems cluttered and everything seems kind of new, right? You know, or on the other hand, it seems still cluttered, but everything seems like way too old. Right. You know, like nothing really seems. Uh, you know, organic, I guess you could right. say, to what's happening in the film and what the actors are doing. So you were telling me about well, how I think you try that, to connect yeah. these things. Well, I think that they're, I mean, I think that the spaces that we make, that we design for um, these events are sort of an experiential kind of thing, and you consider what people are going to want to do and how people are going to move through the space, and I think that we kind of, and and so you kind of put yourself in their mindset and like what would they want these people that like this kind of music and what do they think what, how would their afternoon about 
for listening to music? Well, like, how can we provide for them? And I think it's the same in, in film where also just, you know, you're sort of providing, but you're providing to a narrative or someone's story. And so you kind of think through that story and you're trying to think about these different characters and um, what are the choices that they would make in their life and what are the things that they what are the things that they keep and what are the things that they throw away and what do they, you know, so I think that in a way, I, I guess I was thinking, I was mentioning that I felt like like empathy is a is sort of a tool that I use to sort of that to get through these things and just sort of being aware of um, and like collecting information, just being observant, I guess, of people on the street and what like obvious decisions I can I can see and taking note really mental note. Well, was that the right answer? I guess yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that that? Well, we were talking. <laughs> we were talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, we were because, talking about that. I mean, uh, normally in in filmmaking, it seems like. Uh, you know, emotions or considerations like empathy uh, are associated with the people that write the films and direct them, not uh, and with the actors, right? Not with the people that work on the crews of the films, right? You know, not with the not with the cinematographer or you know the art director, or right? Well, I, I feel like I support. I have to support those people sort of visually. So, like, what you know, you get the script and what and the words that the people say in the script is one thing. And then what you also get in the script is a sort of some descriptions about these people. Not really, and then you, you fill in the blanks. So you're kind of trying to support the narrative that the filmmaker and the, the writer want to get out there um, to fill in the blanks for what is the words that they actually say. So, um, so you're just sort of, you know, you're, uh, I feel like sometimes I'm sort of writing alongside them or I'm helping support the writing in the choices that I make to sort of help tell their story, to help like create the truth that they're trying to provide in, in this cinematic experience for people. Uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of films don't really do that or a lot of, a lot of uh, films, you know, today especially in the U.S., are really just based on, on older films. You know, they're just, copying, they're just copying things they've seen somewhere else. Right. I don't mean in the sense that they're making a sequel or, or a remake of something. Right. But that the whole visual style of films is informed by, you know, previous films that have been made, uh, other kinds of television, documentary footage. Successful ones. Uh, yeah, successful things. Like, yeah. like styles. Like it's right. a, everybody There's always a, likes to say when you go to a film, they always like to say, we're making this movie, a combination of this movie and this movie. Like, you know, that always happens. Right. And then it comes up in something else in the end. But, well, correct, but that is how people like to think of things. Yeah, so, so that, that, kind of, that kind of approach is very, it's, it's oftentimes very obvious in films that that's what people are thinking. Right. But in the things that you work on, it doesn't really seem to be the case that when you watch it, you immediately think of other films or uh, other you know, news footage or other, other kinds of historical material that have come before the film, whether it's a film set in the present or the past. Uh, so, so how would you say that your approach to doing this is different from people, you know, when I see their films, they just seem... Uh, you know, imitative and unoriginal and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like, like predictable, I guess. Right. What makes, what's the difference between someone who's, you know, doing an art department well and someone who's just kind of copying stuff that's happened already or that's been done already? Well, I mean, I try to do my best, but I don't know that I'm actually, it's like, I think that a lot of times people, it's, it's an overwhelming job, so I think, you know, I feel a great responsibility to the position when I'm working on a film and I just, uh, I think that I do think it through, through all of the details, um, but, um, and I think that maybe a lot of people are, you know, thinking about a style, maybe, and I think that I'm trying to be as truthful as possible about a reality um, that is, that we're creating. And I feel like if that, if that reality is broken by, if that reality winds up being broken, I, I, I feel a responsibility for that. And I just, 
sort of make sure that the truth is very, very deep. So like if anything gets moved or anybody opens a drawer or um, anybody see, you know, wherever you are within that space, wherever the camera goes, that there will be truth and, and nobody, I won't get caught. You know, we won't get caught outside of that reality of that we're creating. And I think, um, and in that, it's, I mean, it's fun for me too to sort of like delve into these characters and, and try to make all of those decisions and just think about, it. you know, sometimes it would be a character that it's actually not written through, like that actually just happened on the Joker. Um, it was actually a main character, it was like um, the, mother, the mother character, but in the script, you know, she was sick in bed for sort of a very long time. So that's, that's how we sort of find her. And, um, and I kept, I was looking in the script and they keep saying, well, what's the mother's bedroom gonna look like? What's that bedroom? What's the apartment look like? And I'm like, but you know, what did she, how did she get this furniture? Like, where, to, what was her job? You know, we only know her, she's sick in bed, right? So like, where did all the stuff come from? Like, did she buy it at a thrift store? Did she have credit cards? Did she have a job? Did she have a boyfriend? Did she, what was her source of income? Like, where did these things come from? And then, um, so I kept asking, and they kept just saying, well, I don't know, like, maybe she, like, maybe she collected things. And I was like, okay, like, what <laughs> did she collect? Because <laughs> I think, like, in their mind, they automatically thought, it's really cluttered, you know? But they don't have a specific sick. idea of right. the clutter. Right. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that was so, you know, I felt like it wasn't written. It wasn't written. So I just sort of tried to, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I would present and provide. And we kind of then I kind of forced them to write this, write it, you know, write the story and think it through and stuff like that. So this that. is this is obviously kind of a bigger, more Hollywood film than some yeah. of the other things we've worked on. Yeah, so, so it's a studio, they call it a studio. The studio movie. picture, yes. Yeah. So, so when you were talking to people about this, are you talking to the writer, the director, or the I'm actor? I'm talking to the you talking production to? designer. The production designer? Because it kind of trickles down. So the production designer, he's running the whole, you know, he has the scenic department, the construction, the art direction, um, the set decoration, prop department, so all, all under him. And so, um, and I think you know what probably happens is that the director says, "What's it going to look like?" Because he doesn't really know. And then he looks to me and says, "What's it going to look like?" Let's let's give them a look on on you know Wednesday. I'm like, so anyway. Then we just start to sort of start putting things together, and then um, we give them options, and then we then they pick sort of direction, and if they pick. A direction, then I, I'll fill that in, and things like that. Or I can sort of, I can if I can just get them to choose wallpapers, then I can I know from the decision that they've chosen, I know I can fill it in from there, kind of. And is it easier to do this in something that's like the, I guess a film like that doesn't really have to be realistic in some ways. It's not like um, if you work on a Nicole Holof senior film, or yeah. something that's set in the present. It's a very recognizable reality. It's you know Brooklyn or something right. now. Something like that is more, I guess, uh, fantasy. It's mm -hmm. actually it's actually not it's that not. this pro that that film is not fantasy. It's very much like a character driven, um, a character driven story. So um, I think that it was important that everything was very real and not, you know, not too. I, I, you know, I think people anticipated. You know, they don't anticipate that maybe it was going to feel like that, but is we're it set, sort of... Is it set in the present or in the past? It's set in... It's sort of an ambiguous time, so it's somewhere between the 80s and the mid-70s. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. So it's the backstory of the Joker. It is, yeah. That we've all been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you were also telling me that when you design uh, spaces for you know things like restaurants, you also try to you know treat the owner or the chef or whoever is in charge of this right. kind of the same way as the director right. or the or the character in the right. film. Right. Well, I think that I because from working in film, it, it, you have that to start with. So um, I think that that's where my muscle goes. That's how it's easier to start. I start with. And try to create or work with the, you know, what is the story? Like, who do they want to come here? Who is this chef? And so, um, 
it's easier for, it's easier I guess you know to try to understand like create some kind of narrative for each um, project and wh which what do you prefer working on the most I like that I don't prefer either, any of them. I'm a little bit of a leaf on a stream, which is why I kind of have wound up doing uh, like a variety of things, which I think I feel really lucky about. And But basically, if somebody calls and just kind of, if it works, I'm not, I just kind of check, I just go, I do it. <laughs> and and for, at first, it's funny, but people think that I can do, you know, or over the past year, people have just sort of, said, well, oh, well, why don't you just do this restaurant, you know? And now I'll be like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And then, um, but I've never done it before. But, you know, and then I feel like, but you can, you know, I feel like just, just kind of getting, accepting the challenge and um, winning the challenge, then you have that. Well, what was the hardest one of these that you've ever had to take on with not really having done it before? Um, it's, um, after that restaurant, I did. Um, they asked me to do the same restaurant group asked me to do like take a large box restaurant and um, create and create a, like a contemporary family like kind of New York style you know large restaurant, and that required a lot of architectural decisions. Which <laughs> I thought it was funny that they thought. I knew how to do all that. Well, what do you mean by architectural decisions? You know, they said, means? well, let's resurf it. What do you think we should do with the outside of the building? And, uh, you know, <laughs> and then I was, I would, um, and then I would just tell them. And then I would just follow my instincts. And then I was like, oh, well, we should just change the roof and put a peak up here and maybe, uh, you know, do this. And like, maybe like, okay, okay. And then they're like, all right, let's do that. <laughs> you know, and then, and then you just kind of can figure it out. Where somehow. is this? That was a, a restaurant in Edison, oh. um, New Jersey. A peak? Yeah, we were going to put, it was supposed to be, it was like a, um, a Thomas Edison themed restaurant. Oh, okay. But like, a, you know, well, that was just sort of a fun thing that we were going to do all these kind of funny, like experiential restaurant. Um, but it wasn't, it wouldn't feel like a box restaurant inside. But we thought we would try to put an observatory mm. on the top of it, I see. you know. I mean, so, I don't really know, actually. Right. <laughs> I, it's hard for me to picture Thomas Edison themed restaurant, except for the Edison bulbs that all restaurants No, have. it didn't have any Edison bulbs. No that Edison was bulbs. The, their first rule. Okay. No Edison bulbs. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, you know, you were telling me also that a lot of forms that you like to use, I guess this is the opposite of Edison in some ways, mm -hmm. a lot of the forms you like to use are very organic. And you like to use fabric and you know knitted things right. and uh, you know stuff that you make you know for characters in the films, uh, not just stuff that's bought or or you know what have you. you know, right. what, what what do you mean by that? Or what is it that these things add to these um, environments? Well, I mean, I think that I I, I like working. I like um, having a relation, relationship with the material that when I come to. When there's like an idea about something is taking the material and not forcing it to be something else and just sort of respecting what the material is and sort of then combining it with something else in order to kind of transform it into in, to transform it and like when that when some kind of transformation works I feel like that there's success you know if you take if you take something and just um, like just respect like what it wants to do naturally. Well, what do you mean by that? What's an example of that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, when I work on events and stuff, I, I do like to use balloons a lot. Because I think, um, it, I don't know if this is. Well, balloons I mean, are often used just to fill up space. and. I know, know but balloons have festive. like an iner like an energy in, in them like already. And I think like if you take a balloon and you, you can twist it or turn it and like sort of ha or have a, um, you can use it as a, as a linear you know, something linear, or it just has a it has a quality about it that's that you can't break, kind of. Well, you were telling me specifically about knitted things, right? That you and make. I do like. I mean, I like knitted things, and I I worked with them a lot when I was in my studio, because I feel like um, there is like an organicness to to take, and it's like a, I think that it's made up of threads, and there's these lines and. And I think that it has, um, it also has like a human quality to it because they're usually made for the human body. And 
Um, and then I, and also I'm not, so anyway, I think that maybe are, we are going to the sock painting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I am a fan of, of knitted and fabrics and, um, and I think that uh, this, this piece that I made for the art barge here for tonight was an idea that <clears throat> I had um, sort of stirring with uh, for a while. And I thought that it was appropriate here because it reminded me of like seagulls and birds. And, um, and, and, and I think this is like an example of a transformation for me that um, I enjoy. Well, uh, should, we, should we have questions now? Should we open it up sure, to? Yeah, the, I don't know where we are on time, but it's up to you two. We're at 10 for Yeah. Sure. OK. Does anyone have any questions for <laughs> us? <laughs> Yeah, the, the, please. Yeah, um, so I get the sense that you had a rich kind of interior life, uh, maybe in your childhood, or because to take the leap from doing large scale drawings in, in the privacy of a studio, I assume, um, to kind of all of the imagination that goes into working on a film or on a restaurant and you're creating these you're creating your own film it seems in your head so is there do you have a background in, like did you read a lot as a child did you watch a lot of movies where did that interior storyline or the curiosity come from um i think it was actually i i don't really think that there's an interior story necessarily i think it was maybe just like a visual curiosity or just like Watching, I mean, I think that some of it might come from, you know, I think of being a middle child in some way. So I feel like you're, you're sort of aware of what, how everybody feels and you're just sort of a mediator, right. you know? And I think like that, that is, I mean, in a funny way, I, I don't really know exactly how to connect those things, but I feel like they have something to do with each other. Like um, just, you know, I think that, uh, that I think, um, is like bringing a lot of things together and then also just like reading, being able to read people. I think and being aware of like every, you know, being aware, I think that that helps me like when I'm trying to think through characters and stuff like that. But um, so it's, it's more emotional? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's emotional. And why, why stripes? Why stripes? Well, I think that stripes are sort of both active and flat, you know, so it was kind of a fun, it was just sort of, it's sort of a flat surface, yet uh, I think that the, some of the, um, I think that some of the um, things that I was trying to sort of create depth against something that was forcing itself to be flat. Mm -hmm. There's a moiré. <laughs> uh -huh. But my eyes aren't able to focus. But also, um, I run an, an art center out here, and we had an artist in residence recently. His name's Andre Terrell Jackson. And he is fascinated with the history of stripes, and there's a book that he referenced um, where this, the author does an investigation to stripes and their meaning. And I guess historically, stripes have been used to identify people who are outside of societal norms. Mm -hmm. So slaves, prisoners, um, Holocaust, Holocaust prisoners. So, um, so now uh, Daniel Buren is an artist who used stripes in everything. And I just, every time I see them now, right. I think that they're, they're, they're somehow identifying something. But right. they're just, for you, they're, they're just a contrasting. They don't have any political or historical dimension, in other words. For no, you. I don't yeah. think so. I mean, I think it's just sort of happened at some point that these two things came together. And um, yeah, and I mean, I like stripes too, but I don't think for those reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? That I know of. Yes, in blue.
creating design documents that get passed around because it seems like there's so many streams of input and so much that happens between the words on the page and the storyboard. Yeah, I mean that. Um, well, I mean, I think yeah. a lot of people that she that Chris works with don't necessarily have storyboards. Isn't, isn't that true? It's true. Yeah, that's unless it's a studio film. I mean, what Wes, um, the first Wes Anderson movie that I worked on was um, The Royal Tenenbaums, and we were handed a script and a storyboard that will equally thick. So he goes in the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, then yeah. It did, it's, not, it's not the same lately, but it's, yeah. Anyway. But that was, um, right. So. No, it's not. It's really surprising. I mean, I work under the production designer. So the art department is, like, there are reference pictures, you know, everywhere on the walls, you know, when you get into that. But when you get a script, um, you know exactly what you're responsible for just by, because um, it's all divided up. Everybody, every department knows exactly what they're responsible for. So when I read a script, I know, I know what I'm required. And, like, I think maybe um, then we just sort of, you go in and we, you start to see the textures of things that people are looking at and like what, and then you start to like in your area start to pull in colors and, um, and textures. And I think there's like a lot of discussion in the hallway, you know, and then uh, you kind of, you can be, you can think you're on a path and then like it'll be maybe three weeks, four weeks and you're like shopping and buying stuff and then all of a sudden you, you find out, oh no, I thought it was be more like this. So you're like, okay, and then you go here, you know, and then you're like, oh, this, this kind of character. Um, and then I, th I think that you do get things approved more or less, you know. I, I like to work with directors that kind of know, um, that are that are sort of that kind of know that what they're expecting they, like they hire me because they know what I'm going to bring to the table a little bit but it's a long process I'd say um, it's a um, and it's there's a lot of communication but at the same time I think that I go when I go shopping and I just buy stuff and I send it back to the shop um, it's surprising how no, like I just buy stuff and nobody knows where I'm buying. You know, like no, there's not like, you know, they don't, you know, no, there's no guideline really to say like nobody's saying, oh, you know, make sure you buy china or anything, you know, or, or make sure the china is floral or anything. You know, it's just sort of, you just sort of, um, um, just sort of start collecting per character. And you warehouse it, and you warehouse it, and then when there's time, then that time comes when you're supposed to dress that set and you sort of start bringing it in. And then sometimes the director will be like, oh, that chair is like, we, I thought the chair would be brown, you know? And I think like it should be this kind of chair. They, they'll get like hung up on certain things, you know, that, that are really, that they need or specific to them. Um, but they don't tell you that ahead of time? No, no, <laughs> they don't. Never? No, they don't, know. they have a lot of other things to think about. <laughs> Well, if you worked on a film that had a lot more computer effects and thing in it, things in it, that you know, like a Hollywood film, would, would in that case would they have to tell you everything ahead of time because it's going to be integrated into this kind of? I'm Pardon? It's oh, well, it's part of the answer. I was trying to part of the answer. Push now, it into I, I will it. say that, like this, stu <laughs> like the last this. I think the Joker was kind of the biggest studio film that I worked on, um, and and there was more of we did a lot more rendering. You know, like I would buy furniture and then I would tell the rendering guy what the furniture was going to be. And then he would do a render so that we could show the director what the room would be look like. So we would do a lot of that. Uh, I guess in the green coat. Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. I write books on top of it when it's, when it's done. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a sad, sad story, but, um, you know, at the end of things like that, we, we, you know, sometimes we try to reach out. You don't really have a lot of time to get rid of things, but anyway, at the end of a movie, we have a sale. We have sales or, um, or it all gets collected. Um, you know, maybe they'll collect certain sets that they think they might shoot in again or do reshoots in, and then it'll go and get packed, go into a trailer, and then 
go into a hole in Los Angeles somewhere and logged. But, but when you say sale, you mean so that people on the crew can buy the stuff. That's not, true. Not that it's open to the public. That's tr yeah. true, true. Yeah. Kind of. Um, yeah. Yes. So in the beginning when you were drawing large and you weren't afraid of scale, and then when you started doing events, you're working with a lot of moving parts and people. So how did you transition to getting used to being then a producer and a designer and a director, but having to manage all these other moving people and parts? I guess having been in, I mean, film, Film ha is so structured, and it's like a giant machine, you know. And and just I think observing how that machine works is very, very. It's like a very successful, you know, operation. And it where every every job works very much the same way. And I think that because there's a lot of money involved, they've really got it down. And I think that you know is isn't necessarily how most business works. Right, so I think when I have that experience and I can see, and I see how all of that, what needs to happen and how all of that works, I think that translating that into other, you know, other kinds of productions or restaurant, the restaurant world or, you know, event world, it, you know, it's the same muscle, you know, so I think it's, um, I think that it's great training, you know, working in film because outside you know when I when I was doing the Red Bull stuff like they were just like wow like are we this is like really organized you know like you're doing this this is really fast and like when I went into the restaurant when I was doing a restaurant I did the restaurant in like three weeks and I think and we, sh we closed the restaurant we worked on it for three weeks we closed the restaurant for 10 days. We did the whole restaurant in 10 days. And I think normally they work with large, ar with large like architectural companies and things like that where I, I think maybe the process is much longer. You know, so I think um, the film, film production is very efficient and it's good training. This and the man in the blue hat here, black hat. Um, I want to start by saying <laughs> some, uh, some other people in the audience can say the same thing that you look at a movie, you look at the director, and the D sometimes the DP will go deeper and deeper, but you know, it doesn't go, go, in, go so far into the set design. Um, I'm a big fan because I saw uh, uh, Moonrise Kingdom uh, in the theater when it just came out, and I remember uh, the opening sequences were incredibly balanced, and um, it, was, it was just fascinating to, to, watch, you, you know, to watch those opening sequences and to watch grow and develop and you know it's so incredibly stylish I and mean, you wasn't off the air I think yeah uh, that one it was really magnificent so thank um, you but my question to you is um, since now I know you worked on uh, the Royal Tenenbaums there was a scene uh, in in that movie that I remember so well um, it, I know that uh, uh, Owen Wilson was in it and it was somebody else I can't remember who was Luke Wilson or Ben Stiller but <laughs> because I'm going to tell you why. Because there were two paintings in that scene. Yeah, that, that was really my question. Oh, okay. Okay. It was. Two paintings in oh, in Art Wilson's apartment, and then right to the right, right there's a little. Oh yeah. With the Sarah Underpants. Right. <laughs> well, those are both. All right. So, so anyway, <laughs> <I> remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, though. Right, so, right. <laughs> I remember being doubled over by that scene just because the, the, the paintings were so powerful. And they're kind of like juvenile. There are these, you know, these guys on trikes with right. masks and everything. And I told a friend, I'm like, the scene in this movie is just it's so unbelievable. And you know, she said, oh, that's uh, apparently it's a Mexican uh, uh, artist, or Mexican or, or Latin artist. Anyway, can you tell me, um, do you have a hand in choosing those? And can you tell me how it arrived at that at that scene? Because it really just runs over the, the characters for sure. And it's dominant. Right. Well, the you know, um, I think when working those are Wes's Wes, those are Wes's personal paintings. Oh, I see. Okay. And he and like he and he sort of wrote them into 
he wrote them into the into those scenes. But I mean, um, in in that particular case, right. and that was also you know an earlier film where I think you know he, when I talked about that storyboard, like the storyboard would be this would have the scene on it, and it would say like brown hound's tooth tablecloth, you know. So it was sort of a training for me, really. Um, it was like brown hounds to table cloth. My mother's sunglasses, you know, the, my, the, my neighbors, like, you know, this, and, you know, everything was called out because, like, he just sees the entire film, like, in his head, you know, so, in, you know, so everything was called out. So, those, you know, those paintings he brought to that. That Hugo is an artist, a friend of his that made the underpants, the, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so that's the answer to that question. But I think much later, um, we there was a group of us who worked on those um, um, on his work, and uh, it was fun because the, he kind of was trying to let go of of some of that. And I think Moonrise Kingdom was one of was was one of them, where he was um, he kind of like brought he like we were out into nature now, so there there's we don't have that much control over that. And he and he kind of changed the process. So like the actors didn't have trailers. They had to like, he was like, they can put on their own makeup and do their own hair. And like, you know, he was trying to take away all of the controlling elements of filmmaking so that it would shake the whole thing up a little bit, you know. So like, or the, you know, okay, well the the prop department has can't have a giant trailer anymore. We're gonna have a small footprint. We're just gonna make this, let's just make this movie out here in the woods, you know? And so he was just trying to like loosen it up. Yeah. So it has but still I found that film has incredibly balance to it. Everything the, the tents, the churches, yeah. you know. The tents are, you know, the you know, we were yeah, I became a tent expert, but like I would make, I was making like some of those tents. I just invented how they were put together. The one that they were camping on the shore was like, I mean, I just, just made, totally made it up. And the other ones we had, I had made by a react, um, a reenactment company in like New Hampshire who made old-fashioned tents. And, and then we, and yeah. Wasn't this shot on an island as well that you had to go to? Was, it, was that right? Was that that movie? No. Okay. Sorry. That was the, the Crucible. That was the Crucible. Oh, yeah, I, can, I confused those yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, this lady in the glass. Um, how would you describe your personal style in terms of like interiors, and your own personal aesthetic, and like what you gravitate towards, and like what excites you when you walk in somewhere, and you're like, oh my god, I will take the jackpot, I have to have that. Like, all of <laughs> Um, let's see. Um, right. I think that, um, I mean, I tend, personally, I tend to like, um, I like, I like, um, I like design from other periods. And I'm interested in like, what I'm mostly drawn to, I feel like, is like, um, tertiary design elements, so not the more iconic things that were common, but it kind of like the things that were um, more everyday items or like kind of celebrated, but not by icons or things like that. So, and I, I, like, a, I like to find a good design that like, um, that was an everyday item. And maybe that has a function. I always think that that's kind of interesting when you can, then it, when it solved a problem, you know. Like I have, there's like one thing that I re, that I like enjoy, which is like a straight razor sharpener. You know, like it's this chrome it has a black stone and a chrome, and it it holds a straight edge razor. And you turn this handle, and it flips the razor over, and it rubs it around the stone. But it's just like this beautiful, simple thing like that. I mean, and I'm also, I mean, I'm attracted to like very, you know, 60s, like more shape oriented, you know, things that are. Um, clean, and then I don't know. I, I mean, I think that's not a specific time period, but I like. Um, I, I guess I like to combine. I like to combine them, and I think that um, that um, that that's. I don't know how I could answer that entire well, question. I mean, like, Like, 
mm -hmm. you know, like a general. Right, I think that I, I kind of like, I like color. I don't, I like to have the walls pretty empty so that I, I can, my eyes can rest, yeah. but I like them a lot of saturated colors sort of in the environment along with like very new, like mixing, like, like very shiny white things with, you know, next to like sort of driftwoody things and things like that. So that everything, all the things can kind of like sing their own song in their own little space, you know, but sort of like work harmoniously. Not too quadrant. Yes, in the Steve Zazu hat. <laughs> Um, she um, collects a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what you're going to say to this, but I don't know. What do I? And what do I? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. What do I collect? E everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sometimes in film, I, I you know, you, you, um, because at the end of the film, that things kind of just disappear, and I think they go out of circulation, and they do wind up trying to. Buy, you know, save things that um, I don't want to just just disappear. But I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe I, I mean I have too many couches. Oh yeah, a lot of couches. <laughs> a lot of couches <laughs> and lamps. There we go. Yeah. Couches and lamps. Cou couches and, I, and lamps. And when I'm on a job, I buy too many chairs. <laughs> I think we should wrap it up. Okay. Wrapped at 5:30 in the morning. Drove out here, put this up, and now it's. <laughs> I think we should wrap it up. Okay.